Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to welcome you to the second webinar of the Neuroimaging webinar series, jointly organized by Eatris and Neuratris. My name is Rosan Vechter. I am Education Manager at Eatris, and I will be hosting this webinar today. We are very pleased to have three speakers joining this session today about microscopy in neuroscience. First speaker is Martin de Kort. Martin is Program Manager Translational Medicine and Drug Development at Eatris. After obtaining his PhD in bioorganic chemistry at Leiden University, he joined Organon working on synthetic heparin conjugates for treatment of thrombosis. From 2007, he worked in several pharmaceutical companies, including Schering Plow, Merck, and MSD, involved in lead optimization. After developing Aatris and its platforms as it is today, his prime interest is to match industry clients with Aatris infrastructure experts in the most efficient way to start new public-private collaboration. Second speaker is Laurent Duquesne. Laurent is project manager at Neuratris and French national coordinator for Aatris. She's engineer in bioinformatics and modeling and has experience in managing projects that specialize in bioinformatics, bioimaging and neuroscience. Last and main speaker for today is Basil Gertrenkov. Basil holds a PhD in developmental biology from the Pierre et Marie Curie University in Paris. He then worked as a research engineer at the French National Scientific Research Center, CNRS. He also worked at the French Institute for Genetics and Molecular and Cellular Biology, where he coordinated the Imaging Center. He is now the Operational Manager of the Brain and Spine Institute Core Facility, ICM Quant in Paris. He has solid expertise in bioimaging applied to 3D cellular and developmental biology models. I will now give the floor to Martin de Kort, who will tell you a bit more about Aatris. Thank you very much, Roseanne, for this kind introduction. And I'm happy to tell a little bit more about Aatris uh, before we hand over to our expert colleagues in uh, Neuratris in Paris, France. So uh, <clears throat> Aatris is a biomedical research infrastructure. It's an ERIC consortium um, in translational medicine. And its vision is to enable a Europe with an optimal translational ecosystem. Uh, we do that by executing our mission, um, which is to support researchers in developing their translational tools and invent interventions for better health outcomes and society. We are located in 13 countries and we have over 90 academic and nonprofit institutions in our network. And uh, the central coordination and support team uh, in Amsterdam uh, is available to assist with expertise. If you look at um, composition of the network, um, we are composed, we always say, of bricks and brains. The bricks are composed of five technology divisions, of which imaging and tracing is the topic of today. Apart from that, we have also have a biomarkers platform with a lot of omics technologies and three product-oriented platforms in vaccines, advanced therapies, and small molecules. And the brains on the left end uh, ensure that the projects are performed in a compliant manner, moving from bench to bedside with particular attention to quality, reproducibility, and regulatory compliance on national and European levels. Legal and operational support is provided where needed to guide uh, the contracting. Uh, finally, uh, we also have key opinion leaders that can be accessed and recruited to provide disease expertise, in particular in oncology, neurology, and rare disease. Obviously, today the focus will be on zero imaging. If we look at um, the specific imaging and tracing centers that we have in our network, it's depicted on the map here. We have around 38 centers that involved in preclinical and clinical imaging uh, and divided over eight countries. They are all integrated in a multidisciplinary clinical setting, and providing the necessary translational imaging tools in nuclear medicine and radiology. And these sites uh, not only have a track record in preclinical research, but also are experienced in translating imaging tools, tracer, MRI sequences, 
or other protocols into the clinic. And again, the central coordination and support team in Amsterdam can be contacted for more details and can be uh, uh, used in dialogue to take on your request to find the right matching partner. Finally, in more detail, uh, this slide the uh, uh, capabilities that are covered by these. Uh, and these can be divided in three main areas. The first is PET imaging of targeted drugs, biologicals, including the so-called immunopet and the radio labeling of antibodies or antibody fragments, DNA aptomers or nanoformulations. The second focus will be on small molecule PET tracers and quantitative imaging, ranging from preclinical rodent studies to non-human primate models and whole body clinical imaging of humans in early stage studies, including multimodal approaches such as PET CT, PET MRI, and as today's topic, CEST imaging. And finally, a network of ultra high field MRI centers is available for more sensitive and early detection of disease. And in particular, the Neurospin facilities in France are pushing the physical boundaries to develop the most cutting edge infrastructure. I will now hand over the presentation to Lorraine. Thank you, Rosanne, and hello, everyone. Before giving the floor to Basile, I will briefly present Neuratrice, the co-organizer of this webinar series. Neuratrice is the French node of the European infrastructure Eatrice and is the only node whose specialization is solely neuroscience. Neuratrice is also a national research infrastructure dedicated to neuroscience and more precisely to neurodegenerative diseases that are Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Huntington's diseases, and multiple sclerosis. This consortium brings together all the needed bricks to build a full translational neuroscience project and gives you an easy access to multidisciplinary expertise and high-level platforms to achieve your project in neuroscience from bench to bedside. As you can see on this slide, Neuratrice brings together multidisciplinary partners offering a unique synergy to carry out translational projects in neuroscience for academic and clinical collaboration as well as industrial partnership. Neuratrice is composed of expert teams from five renowned hospitals and research centers accessible through a one-stop shop. This means that you can access all Neuratrice core facilities and expertise with a single contract and your project is managed by a dedicated scientific project leader. I will not develop each partner's capabilities further in this webinar, but all this information and more can be found on our website. Here is a brief overview of the neuroimaging capabilities Neuratrice offers to its users. As you can see, it brings you all the way from cellular imaging and histology to preclinical and clinical in vivo imaging with state-of-the-art equipment. Specific Scientific expertise is always paired with technology, along, allowing the development of new methods and applications. Should you have any question about Neuratrice, please feel free to contact me or our business development manager, Ali. We will be happy to answer them and to put you in contact with the experts you need to define your project. I will now let the floor to Basil who will tell us all about optical tools for the imaging of neurodegenerative diseases. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Basile. Thank you, uh, Karen and Lauren, for, for a kind invitation. I want, would not pretend to tell you all about optical imaging tools, uh, but I'll try my best to give a relevant overview of that. So the title is How Optical Imaging Tools Can Be Used for Brain Cells. Well, trying to understand this, first of all, uh, we should remember that around 130 years ago, it was not even known whether the th cell theory applied to the to the nervous cells. The great uh, Czech anatomist, uh, Jan Porquinier, uh, using a compound microscope, was able to describe the fine structure of the cerebellum, uh, which is 
was apparently cellular, but was not yet widely accepted. The compound microscope he used is very much what we use now for for, for our biological studies, which is different from a simple magnification glass because there are at least two lenses: the objective lens and the eyepiece, uh, with the help of which we can project, we can transfer the information from the objective focal plane to our retina or to the detector. At the time, there were no cameras, so it was to the, for example, to the glass plate with the emulsion. Slightly later, uh, the German scientist Otto Deuters, using the uh, compound microscope as well, the very basic one, uh, was able to, to describe, still not being focused on cell theory, the structures uh, in the spinal cord. And he coined the terms which we use until now, dendrites, which you can see here, I don't see what you see my maps, but I'll uh, try to get to point it, uh, and the axons. So these are terms which are uh, which is very well spread, and they're used, they used since 1865. Uh, but there's still no reference to, to cell theory here, and uh, what dieters uh, was more partisan of the reticular theory, stating that the, all the nervous cells are connected by blood vessels. Uh, this, theory, uh, this theory was corroborated by modest uh, Italian doctor Camillo Golgi from Pavia, where the candlelight in this kitchen was ex experimenting experimenting with the uh, slices, I believe, with the cat brain. Uh, his procedure allowed visualizing individual structures, uh, which he accepted as cells, or maybe not. And he was still uh, he was still supporting the reticular reticular theory. Uh, of the of the nervous system, the Spanish scientist, very well known, Ramon y Cajal from Barcelona, he stumbled on the experiments or the um, the methods of the um, of Golgi, and when he stained the cells, he had somehow developed the uh, the protocols. He, uh, he he was really used them very extensively. In out of his observations, he was pretty sure that the uh, that the neural cells are real cells which are isolated and just touching each other. Uh, but still, Golgi, when he learned about it, he still rejected the theory. Uh, it is speculated that the reason of his rejection was the fact that he was adhering to the holistic theory of the living things, uh, holistic philosophy, uh, who, I would say, uh, which suggested that the nervous system would, would be. Uh, would be structured, for example, as the blood vessel system, when, the, uh, when the, everything is interconnected. Uh, fortunately, well, I don't know whether fortunately or not, the very prestigious uh, German doctor from Berlin, Wilhelm Waldheyer, uh, has written a review in the, in the 1891, uh, in which he, he analyzed uh, with good precision and really universally everything which, which all the things of the field and uh, he stated that, in his opinion, the nervous system consists of isolated units, uh, which are genetically and anatomically independent. So he corroborated very strongly the, uh, the application of the cell theory to the nervous system. Well, somehow Ramon Cajal, he was happy because, because he was proven right, but uh, he never actually forgave to Valdar the fact that he somehow had appropriated the uh, this statement, uh, and Golgi still thought, well, there is no no clear clear proof, so I still will think that's ridiculous. There is no choice. Both were awarded Nobel Prize slightly later. Uh, it was needed to um, to wait almost more than fifty years, actually, uh, to for the advent of the electron microscopy. So the four people from England. Argentina and states were able to prove finally with the still still uh, with the Golgi staining besides uh, that the uh, that the neural and nervous cells are really uh, really isolated and the uh, that the cell theory cell theory really uh, really applies here. Uh, this 
event, or the sponge of events, I would say, uh, started the era of the reign of the electron microscopy of neuroimaging, which lasted until the advent of the uh, epifluorescent skin focals and the uh, epifluorescent immunostain. Here you see one of the first examples of the uh, stain in the ganglions of lobster, stain, stained for serotonin. Uh, for for this seminar, uh, I, I tried to base the structure on the uh, on the review which I found last year, uh, Nature Methods, which is rather comprehensive and it suggests uh, structuring structuring the application of different approaches of the optical microscopy in function of the uh, samples to which these these approaches are applied. So the authors suggested structuring it separating the samples in the transparent or not scattering samples or the superficial layers of the scattering samples. This is the first type. And the second type, the scattering samples. Uh, they identified around six approaches for transparent, for the first type, for transparent samples in the superficial, superficial layers, and more than 20 for the scattering samples. Of course, in the framework of this seminar, uh, we'll not be able to discuss all of them. We'll just start with the very basics. Maybe we'll discuss the more advanced things during the uh, during question answer session. We we'll start start from the epifluorescence. You go through the uh, spinning disc and focal. Is, sorry for the single beam and focal through the spinning disc and focal. Uh, we'll discuss a bit the multi photon microscopy, and we finish with the light sheet microscopy. I hope the structure is clear for you. I'm going to proceed with the standard epifluorescence. Just a small reminder about how it works. It is a very powerful tool. You, this kind of microscope, you send your light from the light source through a decorated mirror through your objective lens to your specimen, which is illuminated everywhere, actually. And you're getting light from everywhere as well, not only from the focal plane, but also from below and from above the focal planes. The light is collected by the objective lens, it's gathered back and sent through the decorate mirror, which filters it from the light from the light source, and then for emission filter, which filters the rest of the uh, light source light and is detected by detector. And the actual, in the, how the present situation, the detector is not anymore the film, but uh, in most of the cases, it's the camera. Uh, the, it is a very powerful approach, which is very efficient. The light is used very efficiently, but the problem is that the light from outside of focal plane is mixed with the light from the focal plane. So the focused light is fixed with, uh, mixed with not focused one, and uh, uh, by the end of the day, the resulting picture is blurred, because blurred plus not sharp makes blurred. Uh, but in most of the application, especially for three-dimensional systems such as any nervous system, uh, systems, sorry, neurobiology model system, right? Uh, we want to image be three-dimensional three and completely sharp. So how are we going to achieve this? Uh, there is a very nice paper which is dedicated to optical section in microscopy. This is the kind of microscopy uh, which includes all kinds of three-dimensional microscopy about which we'll talk later, like confocal, spinning disk, multi-photon, light shade, everything. Uh, it's very pedagogical, so I, don't know if I suggest to read it to everyone. It describes the, though it's not very, very new, well, it's a bit newer than me, but still it's not very new. Uh, and it's very uh, nice, uh, nicely explained the, uh, the application and the um, so the issues of the optical section in microscopy. So this is the uh, so history or theory and how in reality, how in the modern time we're going to achieve achieve the optical section and make our three-dimensional image sharp everywhere. We'll use the invention of Marvin Minsky, which is more known to general public is the was the inventor of many things and. Um, and also he consulted Stanley Kubrick for, for the special effects in the, uh, his um, Space Odyssey 2001. Uh, but what is important for us today is the fact he's also invented the focal in, in the late 50s. 
uh, ironically, he was not even able to test it properly right away because the uh, powerful uh, light sources were not yet available because there were no, no lasers for the moment. They were invented 10 years later. Uh, but he, he lived enough to be, uh, to be able to test them, so the simplified modern looking focal looks, looks like this. So on the right, you can see the, uh, the laser source, which sent the collimated, well, parallel light beam to the, to the optical system. Then it's very, very similar to epifluorescent microscopy. The dichroic mirror sends the excitation light to the objective, which focuses it in a smaller spot within a specimen. And uh, the fluorescence is produced and detected by objective, and everything works like in the, uh, the epifluorescent microscopy. This spot of excitation is smaller, laterally, but still the specimen is illuminated above and below the focal plane. The cones of light to incoming and outgoing light are still there, so the fluorescence is excited there as well. So still, if we do nothing more, we uh, will get the same situation in the epifluorescence microscopy when the sharp is mixed with blurred, giving blurred altogether. Uh, so Minsky suggested adding the pinhole before the, uh, before the detection part, uh, this is a very small hole which allows to, fil uh, to filter the, um, the beams, uh, the rays of light which are coming from the, from the specimen obliquely. And in fact, only, only the rays which are going from the focal plane, the others are the pumper against the walls of the pinhole and they filter out. I hope that was clear. So by eliminating the, just to summarize, by eliminating the out of focus light, we thus obtaining why thus obtaining the optical section effect, which allows what uh, allows us to isolate the individual optical sections. Considering that the spatial information is lost while the while the light is being filtered through the pinhole, uh, this kind of oblige us to perform the raster scanning and acquire the image point by by point. It can be done in two D to obtain one optical section in, and to get the, the entire three-dimensional image, we're supposed to also scan in 3D by either moving the optical system, which allows you to move the focal plane through the sample, or, or moving the sample through the optical plane. Both systems exist in the modern, modern microscopes. Uh, this is the example of the 3D stack of the nervous system of the, of the spine of the zebrafish larvae acquired in our institute. It's very hard to uh, to take, uh, how to say, to get uh, what it is about because we're seeing plane by plane. Well, it is, I hope it's a good example because we see that the out of focus is almost not visible. Everything that we see is supposed to be sharp, but the entire structure is hardly distinguishable. So the easiest way to visualize this kind of image is to use the maximum intensity projection from each uh, of the stack. It means taking the brightest picture of a uh, brightest pixel, sorry, of each uh, of the optical sections. Uh, the result looks like this. So everything um, sharp, uh, but uh, unfortunately the uh, depth information is lost. How we can correct this? There are many ways. For example, one of the simplest ones is to uh, is to encode the depth of different colors. If I do that, I can clearly see that the axons in, in green are in front of the axons of the red using my uh, my color code. Mm -hmm depth bar. If you don't like that, considering that your image is the matrix of the numbers, you can go to, for example, 3D graphic software and visualize uh, visualize your, your structure using, for example, simulated shading, which allows, which allows having an impression, impression of the volume. I hope that was clear for epifocal microscopy. As I said, that it is uh, this approach necessitates point by point scanning, which uh, discards the major part of light, so it doesn't use light very efficiently. We put a lot of light in the specimen. We do not collect a lot of light. We do that point point by point. All that together means that the though the imaging is a good quality, 
that's resolved. The optical section is very good. It is relatively slow and also it photo distracts the, the sample a lot. There were several techniques which are suggested uh, to, to avoid this. For example, not using the fluorescence but uh, not using fluorescence, but using the intrinsic properties of several structures to reflect, okay? Unfortunately, it is not very specific because several structures, we do not choose whether the biological structures reflect or not. It depends on the intrinsic properties, notably on the differences of the refractive, refractive indices. But fortunately for neuroscience, axons with myelin reflect very well. Uh, here is the example of uh, confocal reflection. It works exactly as the epifluorescence, except that you do not ex excite the epifluorescence. You shine a very low amount of light on your specimen, and then you acquire the reflection using the pinhole, so you're making the optical sectioning of the reflectance image. Uh, it works very well with the myelin. It is still very slow. Is relatively slow. It is point as it is point by point scanning, uh, but considering that the reflection is very efficient, you need to put a very low amount of light on your on your specimina, and you do not photo destroy them. And uh, on the right, you see uh, both the pictures of, of reflection and the staining for the control. Uh, they look not identical, but quite similar, and can be used for many of application, especially for in vivo, where when you cannot stay. If you go, go want to go a bit faster, uh, you can use the principle which was which is not new neither. It was the principle of Nipco disc first used for analogical television, analog television, sorry, where the image is recorded and transmitted using the uh, using the rotating discs. Uh, that gave rise to what we call the spinning disc microscope or multifocal confocal. Yeah, where in which the light uh, <clears throat> in which the light goes to, to the specimen through the through the rotating array of micro lenses and also rotating an array of the pinholes. Uh, well, it is not the pinholes are not relevant for excitation. Uh, but the, uh, the array of rotating bean holes is very relevant for emission. So it works like confocal, uh, but uh, this sample is illuminated at many points at the same time, uh, and the detection is also multi-point. Multi -point. Uh, in contrast to the, uh, to the confocals, the detection takes place not using the photomultiplier, but, uh, but the camera. So the uh, so the sampling is constrained by the physical properties of the camera, and the um, and the spectral properties of the scope is somehow more constrained than the ones of the con normal confocal, but it goes many times faster. And arguably, this approach is less phototoxic because, in general, the quantum efficiency of detectors cameras is higher than the quantum e efficiency of the PMTs. Uh, so it is uh, more suitable for, for fast phenomena, such as uh, here on the left, uh, moving calcium imaging in moving nematode. Uh, and another example is the um, myelinization uh, in, the, uh, in the 3D culture. Well, it could have been done with normal confocal, but considering the lower phototoxicity, Arguably, as I said already, we can discuss that later. Uh, the um, spinning disk was preferred. S until now, we have discussed uh, the spatial filtration allowing for optical sectioning by removing the, the emitted light. So by discarding the vast majority uh, of the emitted light and losing the energy and uh, say wasting a lot of, of light, a lot of uh, influence on the uh, on the sample uh, is there is a way uh, to diminish uh, to, to diminish the emission there are several ways the first one is due to the uh, to discovery of this lady uh, Maria Gebert Meyer in the uh, in the 30s which uh, during her doctoral has described the multi-foot and absorbed absorption uh, phenomenon 
due to this phenomenon, a very high concentration of photons, the fluorochrome, uh, which receives two low energy photons almost in the same time, will behave as the fluorochrome, which, had which would have received one photon of high energy and emit, emit a fluorescence in consequence. Uh, white is useful for the microscopy. If you see on the left, the diagram, diagram of one photon excitation in the, in, on the upper part of the photograph, you see the, uh, the fluorescence of the fluorescence emitted by, by visible, uh, say, ex excited by visible light. You see that the excitation takes care, the emission uh, takes place, sorry, uh, emission, both emission and excitation take place in the entire cone of light. Uh, just to remind you, in case of confocal microscopy, imagine when you're doing optical section, for example, you do 70 sections, you will illuminate and excite fluorescence in your entire sample 70 times. It's very likely that you will bleach everything. In the case of the multi-photon microscopy, the sufficient concentration of photons for them to encounter to get to the fluorochrome at the same time occurs only in the focal point. It means that the light is not interacting with the matter elsewhere. This allows us to simplify the design of the scope. In fact, it's sufficient only to take the powerful infrared laser to, to focus it on your specimen, and the fluorescence will be emitted only from the focal point. It means no pinhole needed anymore. So the, the mission of the microscope your mission is only to, to require everything, all the light you're getting, because you know for sure that all this light will contribute to sharp image because it is coming only from the focal plane. Voilà. Uh, it is uh, relatively mechanically easy, but there are several problems arise, like uh, how say the heating of the sample by the lasers because they are very powerful, but also the problem that the spectra of excitation in the mission using monophoton excitation and multiphoton excitation are not exactly the same for, for, for the flow uh, uh, As I said, compared to confocal, it still allows, it allows reduced photo destruction because it doesn't interact interact, uh, the light doesn't interact with the matter everywhere. So the energy, uh, energy, the flow, how say, the interaction of the light with the fluorochrome takes place only in the plane of interest. The second good point is the fact that infrared light goes much deeper into the living tissues. If everything is well adjusted, you can go up to one millimeter deep uh, into tissues, even you can go through, through the, for example, thinned mm, skull of mouse without uh, without necessity to, to make a trepanation. You can see through, for example, through, through the skin. Uh, it is it is uh, very practical. Uh, here is an example of the development, three days development of the spine of the zebrafish larva visualized by multiphoton. And you can see that though the, there was 700 optical sections and the, each stack was, take, was taken 20 minutes apart during more than three days. There is no photo damage visible. Now we'll discuss another way of, re, of reducing the photo damage. I think you know now what, what it is. I heard about it already uh, because now it's rather fashionable. The approach is called light sheet microscopy. Several years ago, everyone called it single plane illumination microscopy or selective plane illumination microscopy for a spin. That somehow now one and somehow now everyone calls it light sheet. But there are very many names for it. So this a lot of names for this, for this approach. So don't be astonished if you um, if you see another abbreviation. In contrast to everything we discussed before, this is not epifluorescence approach, but what is called theta fluorescence because of the theta angle between the axis of illumination and detection. So here, the uh, well, the detection is can 
conventional. The illumination is achieved by illumination with a very thin sheet of light. It's a beam which is shaped in form of sheet and by uh, by different optical devices. The most simple one is the uh, cylindrical lens, for example. And in fact, e the approach is very old. It was invented uh, by these two guys, Zinendorf and Gilmondi, uh, who are actually chemists, and they're using it for studying the solutions of colloidal gold. Uh, and they even managed to uh, get a Nobel Prize for that. The first, I would say, visible, well, relevant biological application dates from 90 years later. Uh, it was application of this kind of microscopy um, to the internal ear of mice, but considering that the poor visualization methods of, the, of that time, it was it was not a lot of impact. But now that paper, uh, th this paper regained the, the success, which is uh, which is rather just. So how uh, we achieve the optical sectioning? Well, we generate the light sheet, the thin, flat light. Uh, we take our specimen and we simply, in most of the cases, move it through the, uh, through the light sheet while acquiring, the, uh, thus achieving the optical sectioning by illumination. Considering that the light sheet is supposed to be always in the focal point, the focal plane of the objective, we do not illuminate the parts of the specimen or which are outside the focus. So everything is supposed to be sharp. Well, but in a sad reality, only the part which is closer to illumination source is well illuminated, and the part which is closer to the objective is well acquired. I would not spend a lot of time in description how we can avoid this defect. There are many, many, many ways to do that. Either you use two-sided illumination, two-sided detection, or you rotate the specimen. There are many ways to do that. There are many modifications of spins exist the world, uh, but uh, still it is a rather efficient approach, considering that it's very fast because you, uh, you acquire the entire plane into time, you're only limited by the speed of your camera, and it's also not benefits from very reduced phototoxicity, uh, considering that you put light only where they are where you need it now, and not everywhere. For information, the uh, Nikon small world contest uh, was won by a light sheet picture, but I hope it was it will be clear enough. Here's developing nervous system within the um, zebrafish embryo. The movie takes 16 hours, you and uh, probably original. Uh, but I hope, though it's gorgeous picture, you can still see the uh, defects about which I was talking talking right away. So on the right you see the thing is blurred, on the left you see that the tail also is kind of not in the focus, though, though theoretically the things which are not in focus you're not at all supposed to see them. Still you see something, you see some, some shadows. So this optical sectioning is not perfect. Uh, what comes uh, with this kind of machine as well is the fact that the uh, mountings are highly unconventional, so you invent each time how you're going to, to mount your sample in it. And here, well, my, my personal opinion, and the work of light sheet microscopes, I don't think that the fish is perfectly mounted, uh, because you see that it, it's been deformed. I think it's, it's mounted in the gel of agarose or something, and its growth is constrained. Uh, it is very hard issue mounting the developing organisms in any microscope, especially in the light sheet, because you need to immobilize them without constraint. It's rather hard. Uh, fortunately, there are many ways now to do that. For example, you can 3D print uh, your holder or to make a mold of a gel, which will allow gravity to keep your sample in place. Uh, when talking about this, because in this type of microscopy, the 3D CAD conception and 3D printing is very useful, more useful than for, for, for a classical, classical microscopy like in focal, although it comes there as well. Here is an example of one of my colleagues, two dog, who is design, designing a holder, sample, for, sample holder for a light sheet microscope. 
it's not to image something living, but it is to to hold in place the transparized brain uh, of the uh, of the mouse, which is uh, more or less centimeter large, which means for microscopy applications, very large. The sample is mounted in a way not to be uh, shadowed from the uh, from the light by the parts of the sample holder. It was rather tricky, and that allowed this kind of imaging, when you can see the entire brain uh, imaged using a light sheet microscope. So I just go to uh, take home message, right? Uh, uh, to um, I here I use the um, microscopy pyramid or imaging pyramid by Philip Keller. It was first printed, I think, in the his review in Science in 2000, 2013. It's a very useful paper as well, where he says there is no ideal system for imaging. Everything depends on the aspect which is more important. Uh, more important for you, and uh, you do not need to you know, need, do not need to hesitate between the approaches. You should combine them. Voila. For example, if you want to to go for special spatial resolution, you go to, to to for example in focal. If you go to temporal resolution, you go for light sheet because it's very fast. Uh, you can um, combine approaches or change the approaches during your project. Uh, here are several additional sources which I uh, which I used in, uh, to prepare this this presentation. There is a textbook in your biology. It's not very new, but it's very classic. I like it very much, and uh, it's very funny because when I was preparing it, I was looking for for a paper about development of the acceptance of the cell theory to the neuroscience and I think one of my closest colleagues who works with me in the facility he has written a paper. He had written a paper about it himself. So I used it as well. It's a very nice paper, but it is in French. I don't know whether, whether it exists in English. I'm pretty sure that yes. Uh, I think this is it. So I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Basil, for your nice and clear presentation. We will now have some time uh, for questions from the audience. I have one here uh, from Martin de Court asking, what is the most relevant translational research qu question with clinical impact that can be addressed using optical imaging of neuronal cells? I would say uh, that was uh, now the approaches which which are here, which is uh, like like imaging using the uh, fibroscopes, right? We can you can really implant something something into the head and to uh, to see what's what's going on, or in the uh, in more simple case, but still you need to open the uh, open the skull. You can go to the uh, to the three photon three photon excitation. Uh, when you go, you lose the resolution, with it, but you can go even deeper. Okay, so three photon is here. So, for example, if you want to go to go deeper through the brain, but still you need to open open the head. Otherwise, uh, the uh, normal normal basic approaches. Uh, can help with the uh, medical issues. For example, you see that the problem of problems of myelinization. I think it's rather, rather easy. So even even the uh, the basic in focal can might help. But there is no uh, no kind of perfect perfect tool for that. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's another question. Um, if not science fiction, what would be required for this technology to be applicable in an in vivo human setting for clinical decision making? Well, it's not. It's more or less. Uh, it would follow more or less what I just said. It's not a science fiction because still I am not sure myself because I I forgot whether you whether it's written down or not. But uh, on I know for sure that because it's done not very, not very far from here that you can apply the multifocal microscopy to the uh, to the cortex of primates. But still, you can you you're supposed to open the open the skull. You're supposed to do the trepanation, but it's very feasible. It's not science fiction. It's not more complicated. It's not more complex than than any neurological operation. Yeah, understood. Yeah. And uh, how does this technique compare to other imaging techniques like PET, CT, MRI? Um, is it complementary or has it specific advantages in your opinion? Uh, it is complementary. Uh, it, it is more usually it applied to more it, to smaller structures, 
uh, and also the specificity of the uh, optical microscopy is high in general. So there's less work of anatomist because you can really uh, uh, really uh, aim the protein of interest. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and I have another question, whether one can use multi-photon excitation for light sheet microscopy. Ah, uh, yeah, uh, it, is, uh, it is feasible. It is it's, uh, using conventional light sheets obtained using the cylindrical lenses, it's rather tricky because there is not enough photons there. They, they're too, uh, too evenly distributed, too how say, sparsely distributed through the, through the space. So it's supposed to put a lot of laser uh, in the tissue and starts starts boiling. But for example, if you use the uh, virtual light sheet, which is generated by a moving beam very fast, uh, this is feasible. Uh, just uh, it's supposed to take in consideration that the, uh, the multi-photon effect effect disappears really easily when the uh, when the beam when the beam hits the obstacle. So uh, this kind of microscopy is been is now developed. It's not something new. Uh, people do that, but sometimes uh, it is not better than normal light sheet because it's somehow more sensitive sensitive to the uh, to the inhomogeneities within the tissue. Okay, thank you. And uh, a last question is about super resolution microscopy and what it can be applied to the brain cells. Uh, the, uh, that's why I thank you for, the, for this question. Uh, that's why I added super resolution here uh, because I wanted to I wanted to somehow inside this uh, say, provoke this question because the authors of the, this frame were not speaking about that. Uh, I think they're not speaking about that for the reasons for how to say for major reasons is the fact that the real well the major super resolution approaches of the uh, stand approach uh, are very photo destructive you photo damaging so you, you send a lot of light to the tissue and you bleach everything and it's and you even can make it, can make it boil but so it doesn't exist commercially but there are several labs, for example, our neighbors in Paris Descartes, uh, Valentina Emiliani, she combines uh, the STED approach uh, with, the, uh, with the photo manipulation uh, and with the imaging within the, uh, with the in vivo, in the heads of the mice. But she, uh, she's not, uh, she focuses on the small portions of the axons. So for the moment, it's constrained to subcellular subcellular studies and not, not very long. So you're not looking for an entire huge anatomical structures which would be within the brains. Okay, that's clear. Okay, thank you. And there's one more, uh, one final question from the audience. Um, that's uh, from Mr. Shahid. How can this technology assist the process of drug discovery and where would it fit? Well, it's very preclinical. You, several things, uh, you can always use the microscopy if, uh, if for the drug testing, for example, on the cell culture, on the experimental animals. For example, you develop the drugs which are supposed to, uh, to accelerate the remyelination of the axons. Uh, then you, you can measure really easily the rate of the remyelination uh, using the optical microscopy. That's the, um, for me, that's the example which, which is rather obvious. Uh, but for the moment, it's not very much applied to humans. So it's very much preclinical. Okay, great. Thank you so very much. We have now come to the end of this webinar. And I would like to thank you all for attending today's webinar with a special thanks to you, Basil, for your excellent presentation. Should you uh, still have any questions for either one of us, I welcome you to submit those to us by email and we will get back to you as soon as possible. And I would also like to point out that we will have another webinar in a week's time about pet imaging to investigate neurodegenerative diseases. We hope to all see you again then. Thank you again and have a nice day.